Okay, so it's uh, 7.59. So maybe by the time I finish the introductions, it will be 8 o'clock, so we can start on time. So good morning, everyone. Again, welcome to the 18th Paase webinar. So the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering is an organization of scientists and engineers of Filipino descent. So in, initially, it was formed by scientists from the U.S., um, and the Philippines, but now we've expanded our membership and we have members in different countries. So for today's lecture, our speaker is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Physical Sciences at Pace University and an adjunct faculty at CUNY York College in New York City. He finished his bachelor's and master's in agricultural chemistry degrees from the University of the Philippines in Los Baños and his PhD in chemistry from University of at Buffalo. As a researcher, he specialized in analytical chemistry, instrumental techniques like chromatography, spectroscopy, and electrochemistry. Analyzing samples of interest in biochemistry, nutrition, food science, and environmental science. He is also involved in uplifting science education in the Philippines through his project, Community or Chemistry in the Community. Initiative giving free webinars and lectures, seminars, workshops, and institutions. The late Elmer Rico Mojica. Thank you very much, uh, Kay, for that uh, kind introduction. So today, uh, I'm going to share to you what uh, has been done in at least the field of Brahman spectroscopy. Okay. So uh, the topic that I'm going to discuss uh, today is just what I have done for the last, I would say, nine years in Raman spectroscopy. So to add some sort of a uh, taste in the title, I put there uh, proving dancing molecules because uh, vibra uh, Raman spectroscopy is really vibrational uh, spectroscopy. Okay, so magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. And thank you for attending this uh, webinar. So when light interacts with matter, there are several processes that happen. So usually there is a transmission, where's the passage of light through the material without the loss of energy. There is a reflection, which is the change in light direction at a fixed angle. There's an absorption, which is the transfer of uh, light radiation to energy within the material. Luminescence, which is the emission uh, of light by a substance that has not been heated like fluorescence and uh, phosphorescence and the scattering, where there is a change in the light direction at different angle. Now, in this scattering, we could say that the scattering can be elastic or inelastic. So we have an elastic uh, scattering when there is a collision between cotton, okay? and a uh, molecule that results in uh, no change of energy, just like what's happening here in uh, Rayleigh scattering. So whatever the energy that is input, that is the same energy that was uh, what we called uh, uh, returned back. So in the end, there is really no uh, change, uh, gain or loss of energy. And we call this Rayleigh scattering. And most of the time, 99 0.99% of the scattering is elastic in nature, like uh, Rayleigh scattering. It's, that's the basis why the sky is blue. Now, however, in some of the scattering, okay, when there is a loss or gain in the energy, okay, you have this inelastic scattering. And this is the collision between photon and molecule that results in a net change in energy. So if the change is uh, you... <clears throat> Uh, what we call losses energy. So there's a corresponding change in the wavelength here. 
So you you have here what we call the Raman uh, scattering in stocks, stocks Raman scattering. But if there's a gain in energy here, this is the Raman uh, anti-stocks scattering. And this is the basis of Raman spectroscopy. And uh, if you're going to look at the intensity, Rayleigh scattering is the strongest, okay? 99.99% of scattering is really Rayleigh. And the, the, the less than 0.01 uh, or 0 0.1 to 0.1% is just Raman uh, spectroscopy. But the change there in the wavelength, that is enough to uh, determine any changes in terms of the vibrational modes in the molecule. Okay, so if we're going to look how uh, Raman really looks like, so I have a, a short clip here. So as you can see here, you can only see Raman, okay, if you have a filter that will cut out the Rayleigh uh, scattering. So Raman is usually weak. And the story on how it was discovered is really a fascinating one. So as early as 1923, uh, Adolf Snecke already predicted the existence of this inelastic light scattering. And then Landsberg and Mandelstam see unexpected frequency shifts in scattering from the quartz. And in 1928, okay, uh, Chandra Sekhatra Benkata Raman and his student uh, K.S. Krishnan discovered the Raman effect. Okay? And the discovery that he had here is he was really confident that this already, already, already exists and it's just time that they will discover this thing. But it took a while for this to be revolutionized. revolutionized. But you know, uh, Raman, when he submitted the paper in Nature, they said that one of the uh, reviewers uh, rejected it, but the editor accepted the thing. And in 1930, by earliest July, he already booked uh, a, a trip going to uh, Sweden because he expected to win the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics, which he won later that year. The announcement came in November. So how did Raman... Uh, discovered this scattering that is named after him. So in, her, uh, in his original experiment, so this is the setup that he had. So he used the, uh, he focused a beam of sunlight and passed this beam to a green filter. So what happened, the green light that was, uh, that was passed through a solution of different liquid uh, during that time, he was able to observe this, there's, some, there's some sort of an emission, okay? on the scattering that it has. So using the chloroform, he was able to see that there's a faint yellow emission coming out of the chloroform. So what happened, the green light, which is higher energy, okay, it was in, uh, in elastically scattered by the chloroform and the resulting emission of yellow light was his proof of the existence of this Raman scattering. And he was able to come up with the, the first spect spectrograph, as he call it here, uh, using the Benzin. So this is, we could say, the first uh, Raman spectra that was uh, reported uh, during that time. And the basis for this uh, instrument, what we call Raman spectrometer, is still the one being used as of today. So most of the Raman spectrometer, they have this laser as the source of light. And what it do, okay, you're going to focus it, illuminate it on the sample, and it results to scattering. So in that scattering, you will see still uh, the, the, the source of the light and at the same time, okay, the Raman emission. So for you to be able to separate the Raman emission, you're going to pass it back through a dry mirror wherein only the Raman emission will be collected. So it will be collected in a charge coupled uh, detector, CCD. And from that, you will be able to see the Raman uh, uh, spectra. And together with the IR, they are known as what we call the vibrational spectroscopy. Because what they do is they look at the vibration of the uh, molecule. That's why I call it the dancing molecules. 
Now, both of IR and Raman, they can be classified as uh, vibrational spectroscopy. But the thing is, the information that you get is complementary with one another. Okay? Because uh, what happened, although they, they, they both involve vibrational spectroscopy, the principle behind the transition is different. Okay? So for IR, usually it depends on the change of the uh, permanent dipole of the chemical bond or molecule with the vibrational normal mode in order to produce absorption. So there is absorption in the IR for the uh, material to vibrate. So we could say IR absorption is a direct resonance between the transition frequency and photon frequency. Now for the Raman, okay, uh, uh, it depends on the polarization or change in the induced dipole to produce Raman scattering, as a, the one that I called uh, earlier as the inelastic uh, scattering. So what happened? Yeah, I hope you the noise. So it scattered the radiation shifted from the incident laser frequency by vibrational uh, transition frequency. So those vibrational frequency that is already the characteristic of chemical bonds or group of bonds in the specific uh, molecule. And this shift of vibra uh, vibrational frequency, these are sensitive to the local environment of the molecule, such as the crystal phase, uh, the local strength, and the level of uh, crystallinity. Okay, uh, local strength and degree of crystallinity. So this is the basis of the Raman uh, spectroscopy. So if we're going to compare an IR and a Raman spectra, this is how they look like. So some peaks you see in IR, Okay, that you don't see in Raman, and some pics you can see in Raman, but not in the IR. So the best thing to uh, uh, what we could look at vibrational spectroscopy is to utilize both techniques. But between the two, IR is the more popular. There are only few people doing Raman. Okay, and if you're going to look at the Raman uh, application, it is useful in pharmaceutical industry especially in API, the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients. It also detects the uh, polymorphic forms of the different uh, drugs. In biomedical, it checks on diseases, proteins, and DNA. And I have one example on that in my presentation today. In material science, it detects the local uh, strain, the lack of crystal, uh, crystallinity, and sometimes the uh, heterogeneous nature of the material. And in terms of nanotechnology, it's been used to analyze the nanowires to understand their structure. In terms of forensics, it's uh, usually used. Uh, I, I don't know if you uh, heard the Batman movie Massacre in Colorado when they tried to check the house of the suspect. They use robotics that contains uh, Raman spectrometer to determine if there's some explosive at his place. And then you can use it for uh, gemology, ge geology, and mineral mineral mineralogy. So if you want to look at the gems, so sometimes if you want to determine if it's fake or not, Raman is a very good technique. And then in archaeology, if you want to detect forgery in paintings, you can use Raman. And I have some guests at my lab who's using our instrument to check okay, uh, some forgeries in the museums around here uh, at New York City. And the good thing is it was used in one of uh, in the Mars rover. They call it the Sherlock. The scanning habitable environments with Raman and luminescence of organics and chemicals. So what this uh, Sherlock has, it uh, uses spectrometers, a laser, and a camera to, uh, to search for organics and minerals that has been altered by watery environments and maybe signs of past microbial uh, life in uh, Mars. Okay, now there are several advantages of using uh, Raman. You can use it at all physical states of sample. You don't need sample prep. The spectra from each uh, material are unique and you can use it to identify the materials conclusively. Uh, just like IR, it's non-destructive. You can always recover your sample. You don't need any vacuum uh, when you do the analysis. It's a rapid uh, analysis, okay, although if you want to improve the uh, signal, you can always uh, collect more uh, signals on it. 
you ca it can work with AQ solution. I think this is the main advantage of Raman compared to the IR. Because IR, if you have the water, you have the hydroxy bonder that forms a broad bond around uh, 3300 region. Okay, so that's one advantage of uh, Raman. Uh, glass vials can also be used. Another advantage for IR, you need to use the salt, the cells. Okay, and for remote sensing, they now uh, develop these fiber optic cables. Okay. Now the disadvantage that you uh, for this Raman is you cannot use it for metals or alloys. The Raman effect is very weak, but you can improve it. Uh, there are ways to improve the sensitivity of it, and you cannot apply this in fluorescent sample. You're going to have some problems if you use uh, samples that are fluorescent, and if you have also samples with color, it may absorb the laser light and it burn. And I have experienced the thing, and uh, one thing is it's a little bit more expensive than IR. That's why it's not really being used uh, more here compared to IR. Okay. So what I'm going to discuss today is what I did with Raman. So I, I, I'm at Pace University. So this is a private non-sectarian university here in New York City where uh, I have. But this has a campus near Westchester which is a train away from the home place of the Clintons, the former president and the secretary of state. And it's easy to see our university. So if you're standing uh, Brooklyn Bridge, so there's our university being dwarfed by the more famous spiral building, the Gary building that we have here, okay? So we're near the city hall, we're near the Wall Street, and we're near the uh, former World Trade Center. It's a heritage right now. So I have an active research group that is made up of uh, almost undergraduate students. And we always call ourselves the team, okay? And we always joke the meaning of the team, which is just Team Elmer A. Uh, o. E. Mojica. So we said, if the students like me, you could say it's awesome. And if the students don't like me, there's also a seven letter word that has the A and O and E on it, okay? But what I usually do is I ask my team to work together because I always say together everyone achieves more. But before I went to what we call the Pace University, I already uh, mentoring uh, students before, even before I took my PhD here in the US, I have an active undergraduate research in UP Los Baños. And then I just continue what I was trained to do when I was there. So as of now, I have 87 students who directly uh, learn from me in one way or another. And of that 87, 54 came from uh, Page University. And the research that I have is usually instrument-based analysis. So I, I uh, usually have experience in one way or another in the trifecta of instrumentation, spectroscopy, chromatography, and electrochemistry. So what I'm going to discuss tonight is part of spectroscopy. And the italized thing that we have here is the one that will be included here. So I have worked with proteins, soil gel, phenolics, food science and nutrition, environmental samples, and then pharmaceutical antibiotics and some nanomaterials. And in addition to that, I also have some experience doing computational chemistry. So here I just use the software okay, to uh, bring some theoretical uh, aspect or perspective in some of the uh, instrumental uh, exper or experimental uh, uh, based uh, projects that I have. So the background that I have with Ramon, when I moved to New York City in 2011, so a common friend of mine, uh, a common friend of us, both of us coming from UP Los Baños, introduced me to a Filipino who is based in York College. So that's the first time I used Ramon. And I would say this is for now the second newest uh, technique that I learned. And during that time, uh, I'm an adjunct working around New York City. And then in the fall of 2011, uh, Pace University hired me as a lecturer. So from Pace University, if I have time, I go to your college to do experiment to the point that I learned how to sleep in the subway station. So if I, I need to sleep while sitting, I took the J train if I have to do it by sleeping or uh, sa while standing, I have to take the mass pass faster than taking the six and the E train until I come to have my own uh, portable Raman spectrometer. So the first 
Uh, I think that I have there. So this is usually the, 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 the university or colleges that I work. Okay, I just don't have a picture in front of Taish University. So this is uh, one of my collaborator who went to me to uh, visit from time to time. So the late uh, Alonso Gabriel. So this is uh, my life that I have uh, during that time. And when I was in the Desamero group, uh, Dr. Ruel Desameros, I was introduced to two Raman and the way that we call is the, the small Raman, which is this one. Okay, so this is Brahma Yasko. And then we have a modular one that we call the uh, big Raman. So this is a modular one. So he, we, he uh, assembled it out of the pieces that we had and he used a laser base in both of these things. So that's my first, uh, we could say, uh, experience in using Raman until I have my own Raman, uh, portable Raman in Pace University. And when I was able to get a grad student uh, to work with him from the Philippines, he, uh, he was able to add another laser line, but using the same instrument for the Raman. So from the 48, 488 uh, argon lamp, it, uh, he was able to, uh, uh, what we call add, uh, a line that's around 544, I think. And then in addition to that, he also purchased another Raman, the UV uh, Raman, which until now had not used uh, itself. Okay, so in his in his lab, there are more instruments than people. That's why I always go in his lab, even though I'm already full time in uh, patient university. And today I'm going to describe to you the studies that uh, I have done in Raman. So the first thing that I, I work is in this so-called amyloid uh, formation. So amyloids, this refers to abnormal fibrous extracellular proteinaceous deposits found in organs and tissues. So usually amyloids, they are insoluble and dominated by beta sheet. So when you have an amyloid, usually okay, that is associated with the so-called the neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and everyone's favorite, diabetes. Okay? So what I did is we tried to look at this uh, peptide known as amylin, which is cross-secreted with uh, insulin. So we could say this is one of the uh, peptide that is responsible for diabetes. So what we did Okay, we look at the chain. This is a 37 amino acids. And we look at this uh, peptide sequence here. And what we do is we prepare it in the lab, the peptide. Okay, and we just altered the phenyl uh, alanine in this NF gel. So what we did with the phenyl alanine, we replaced it with fun some functional groups. Okay, so what we did here, uh, instead of H that is in phenylalanine, we put uh, a hydroxyl group there, a methoxy group, an amine group, and a methyl group. So those are the electron donating group. And then in another uh, step, we also do some electron withdrawing group. We have the nitro group here, the, the, the fluoro, the cyano, and the pentafluoro, where everything was replaced by chlorine. And what we do upon synthesizing, we look at its uh, behavior, okay? if we put it in freeze buffer. So what we're trying to do is, is it going to aggregate? So if it aggregates or precipitate, there's an amyloid formation. And we try to characterize okay, uh, the peptides that aggregate and we use Raman as one of them. So based on the results, all the electron withdrawing uh, group substituent, it assists the aggregation and all the electron donating group substituent, it prevent the aggregation. So what does it mean? Okay, we're trying to find a way if we can develop inhibitors in the amyloid formation. So if we can inhibit the amyloid formation, it is a good therapeutic, uh, what we call the solution for diabetes. So the one that contains the tyrosine, the hydroxyl group in the phenylalanine, it doesn't form any aggregates okay unlike the one that is the electron uh, withdrawing group so what tells us that there's an aggregation aside from the presence of those solid particles this peak at 1617 uh, uh, wave number because this is indicative of the beta sheet 
And then we also have this stick around here, which is indicative for the aromatic ring. Okay. Now we didn't able to see it in the electron withdrawing group. So that means they didn't undergo aggregation. Okay. So whatever we do, we cannot find the ring there. We cannot find any vintage group. And then we also try to look at, us, at some of these uh, functional groups that we use. We ran the same sample since it is non-destructive in IR and we're able to get this peak at 1628 uh, or around 1630, which is indicative also of the big shift. Okay. Now, what we're trying to do is, is what's really happening during that time. So this is the peptide before it has uh, dissolved in this buffer. So as you could see, you cannot find any peak in this region, which is uh, indicative that there's no beta sheet. But once it aggregates, you form a peak at 1674. Now for the ring modes, we observe that there's a shift from 1608 going to 1605. So that means tell us that there's a change in the environment within the, the peptide. And from 1356, the nitro group shift to 1351. Okay, so we're trying to look at about the pi stacking, the, the pi pi interaction. This a uh, specific type of intermolecular attraction that is unique for aromatic ring. Okay, and then we we also notice that among the peptides that that we have in our batch, okay, the cyano takes a while to aggregate. I think we, we observe the aggregates after two or three days. So when we look at, when we monitor what is happening there, so before the aggregation, we, we have a peak at 2,251 two, two, uh, 2, wave number, and then starts to shift to 2,239, and then it starts to shift to 2,234. So what happened here, as it aggregates, okay, the environment around there becomes non-polar. So that's the story that we have. And during that time, I'm already getting full time in Pace University. And I, I told uh, Dr. DeSamero, I, I cannot guarantee my time with you. Anyway, you, uh, you don't pay me for anything. So the, the, the grad students took over the project and he was able to develop some inhibitors out of this. But this is the starting point because out of this, Dr. DeSamero was able to get an NIH, NIH grant to fund the uh, grad students, okay? But I still have a lot of data with me that we have not published. So we monitor in time what is happening with cyano because cyano uh, is a slow uh, aggregating process. So if we're going to look at this at the, at the beginning before the aggregation, it's here and then it starts to shift okay, to a lower wave number. Okay? And then I also look at those fluorocontaining uh, NF gales compare it with phenylalanine and the one that has a lot of what we call the fluoro, the pentafluoro. So we could see here the difference for the pentafluoro. There's a peak here. And as you remove the hydrogen and replace it with uh, fluorine, you see this peak here getting uh, smaller until it's gone when all of the uh, hydrogen in the ring is replaced by uh, fluorine. The same thing that happens here. And then Instead of NF gales, what we do is we replace the phenylalanine with leucine, and we found out that it's still going to aggregate because uh, our, our suspect before is the ring has something to do with the amyloid formation. But we were surprised that even uh, if the ring is not present, the peptide will still aggregate, as shown here as a peak at 1670, which is indicative again of the beta sheet. So that's uh, the story that I have for this amyloid formation. It was interesting, and I'm also doing something about that, although this is more uh, not uh, Raman-related. I'm trying to, do, to look at some inhibitors for this, uh, what we call uh, amyloid formation in amyloid. And the next story that I have there, so during the time I was at York, uh, they have a MALDI instrument. And one of the matrix that they use is the cyanohydroxy Genomic acid. And I, I was always fascinated with uh, cyano. So cyano is unique because you can find it around the 22 to 2300 region. So what I, I, what I did, because I have all the leeways to do any research in the lab, is to compare the derivatives of cyanohydroxynamic acid and then 
to answer the, the question, why is it effective as a matrix for MALDI while its isomer is not? Okay, so what I did is we look at all the derivatives of the cyano. So the cyano uh, four hydroxynamic acid, and then we ordered the cyano three hydroxynamic acid. We cannot find cyano two hydroxynamic acid. So what we did is we use instead the one that doesn't have the uh, hydroxyl group, the cyanocinamic acid. And then the other one, the one that doesn't have the cyano. So we just have like a, an assignment paper. So we just compare the, the four cyanohydroxynamic acid derivative. And from that, we were able to come up that there's really a difference okay, in the Raman of these four uh, derivatives. But what fascinates us is at the 3300 region, the four cyanohydroxy acids has this uh, sharp peak that cannot be observed in mm -hmm. the other uh, what we call uh, derivatives. So that's the basis that we have for another study. And then we, we look at the cyano region. So it is expected what we have, the uh, cumaric acid doesn't have anything because it doesn't have cyano in its uh, molecule, okay? So the next study that we did is, okay, let's compare four with the three CHCA. Why is four being used as the MALDI derivative? And what we found out is consistently whether it's a solution or a solid matrix, there is always the hydroxyl group, okay? As, as shown here. So the one that is uh, broken line, that's the four derivative. The one that is a straight line, that's the three derivative. And in most of the uh, cyano thing that we have here, you, you could see here except for pH one, okay? So pH one maybe is a, a lot of hydrogen there. So some of the cyano is attached to the hydrogen. Okay, because you have uh, nitrogen reacting with hydrogen. And the one that fascinates us is this one, the hydroxyl group. So it's only at pH 14 that we don't see the hydroxyl group. So what happened at pH 14? There is no hydroxyl group because it is deprotonated. And consistently, only the four has peak compared to the three derivative. So we found out here, okay, that the presented data that we have, maybe it's because of the symmetry that allows the four cyanohydroxycinamic acid to be an effective matrix compared to the uh, three derivative, the three cyanohydroxycinamic acid. We also try to uh, use uh, NMR for that, uh, what we call the study to determine the thing. So the one that I did is all on the Raman and then Jason did the NMR. And from that, we're able to come up the paper in the Journal of the Raman Spectroscopy. And then the last thing that I have uh, done with the group, again, uh, I, I just look at some of the chemicals that we have there. So I noticed this estrogen, these are uh, hormone, okay? And I, I look at this, oh, I have a ketone here, I have a hydroxyl here, I have a diol here, and then I have a a hydroxyl here and a triple bond. So maybe I can differentiate them using Raman. Okay, and that's what we did. So it took us over a year to come up with this slot here. We have to use the big Raman because the, the uh, signal is so weak, we cannot get it in the small Raman. But in, in the small Raman, we're able to show uh, some differences. Okay, so this is at this region around 300, which is the CH bond. And this is at the different region. And here we can see the, the one that is the ketone, it has a, a peak exclusively at 1751. And the one that has a triple bond, it has a peak around the 22 to 2300, okay? But the unique and the common peak that we found is in this region. So we found out that all of them has a peak at 790. And then they have a unique peak at a particular wave number. So we, we, we are worried, uh, is this paper going to be another assignment paper? So we said, we, we have to put some uh, marketability in this paper to be accepted. So what we did is we tried to use some sort of an analytical method of it, how to determine uh, this estrogen, let's say in an original sample or in a real sample. So what we did is we find a solution or we find a solvent where we dissolve it, we can still maintain or we can still see the common peak and the uh, unique peak. And we're able to use dimethylformamide 
And what we did is we look at the uh, intensity normalization. So we normalize uh, the peak, the, the unique peak with the common peak. And what we do, we use it to get the ratio of the estrogen, uh, the estrogen when we use a uh, mixture, okay? And we're able to come up with this different mixture and the, the margin of errors that we have, some can be as low as 1%, but we, we get as high as uh, I think 26, uh, 27%. So th that's the story that we came from this, uh, what we call estrogen. And then the next time that uh, we have this, this is already a mixture of me doing it at pace and going to your college from time to time. So as I told you, I was fascinated with the Sayano group. So in 2017, there's a session uh, in ACS about Raman spectrometer and the organizer decides to write a book chapter and he sent an invitation to us. So I talked with Dr. Desamero. I asked him, do you want us to do some book chapters uh, thing here? And then he said, okay, get all the data that we have and we're going to uh, do this thing. So we wrote, uh, I wrote four chapters with uh, him three uh, on it and he wrote four with three with me here. So we come up five uh, book chapters in that book. So the first thing that we have here is we look at the different cyano uh, material that we have, including the latex glove, the nitro gloves that we have. And this is what we observe, okay? As the size of the materials uh, in increases, okay, there, there, there's a corresponding ship that we observe. And then we're supposed to include this one, but he asked me to remove this. So this is the different cyano with the different side chain. And I also included here some uh, peptide, okay? So the way that we look at this is the, the, the bigger the side chain, the lower is the intensity of the cyano group. And then uh, we try to look at the solvent uh, effect. So what we have here, this is a methoxy nitrile. So this is an electron, uh, methoxy benzonitrile. So this is an electron donating group. So what we observe when we put them in a solution, that most of them uh, shift to a higher uh, wave number. But when we compare it with, with an electron withdrawing group, which is the cyanobenzaldehyde, the change is not as what we call pronounced as it is with the electron donating group. And included in the chap book chapter that we have is the uh, an ionic liquids, okay? So ionic liquids during that time, that's the second, we could say popular paper behind nanomaterial. So I chose this uh, ionic liquid because that's the cheapest that we have in the catalog. Okay, so you know ionic liquids, this is what? Uh, salt that is uh, liquid at room temperature. So I asked my undergrad student to do a calculation in Goshen Okay, uh, putting it at the different solvent in Goshen. And then what we did is we mix the ionic liquid with different solvent and we found out this one. Okay, so in water, if you're going to look at the peak area that we have here, it, it broadens. Okay, so this means that the environment of the ionic liquid here with water is uh, heterogeneous in nature. And it makes sense because here it's all ionic liquid, but if you mix it with the different solvent, so your environment becomes more heterogeneous. And I also look at the salt gel. So this is the reason why I was fascinated with cyano. So when I was doing a PhD, I prepare uh, different uh, formulations of salt gel. I was always fascinated with the cyano because it's the only one that gels at the same day. The rest would gel uh, two weeks after. So it made me curious why cyano behaved during that time. So what I asked my undergrad is to monitor the step-by-step soil gel process. So soil gel is a wet chemical process that involves the formation of the inorganic colloidal suspension, which is the soil, and the gelation of the soil in a continuous liquid uh, phase, which is a gel, to form a three-dimensional di network structure. So what I asked my student is to monitor Okay, step by step by Raman and IR, what is happening to the cyano triethoxy side lane? So what we observe as we add more materials in it until it becomes solid, okay, there is an increase or the widening 
of the peak. So again, that is due to the heterogeneous uh, environment where the cyano is. And the IR has the same, uh, we could say, result as that of the Raman. So start here when it's all cyano, and when it becomes solid, it's already uh, wider than the one that we have here. And we also use other functional group on this one. And we're, we're trying to finish a paper of this, although this was done almost five years ago. Okay. And we look at the calculation, what is happening, if it's uh, unhydrolyzed or hydrolyzed. So we expect that the hydrolyzed is an hydroxyl group because if you have a hydrolyzed, this, uh, hydrox uh, the, this group that you have there will have a hydrogen. It undergo hydrolysis. Okay. And when I have the portable Raman that we purchased for 15,000 in 2013, so I want my students to do it, okay? So out of the things that I asked them to do it, I used them in the experiments, we're able to come up with uh, book chapters that we have here. So the first students who did it, I, 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 we have a very simple uh, experiment. So we put benzene in a vial and I asked him, I, I asked her, to get the uh, Raman spectra. And then I asked her to run a calculation in Gaussian. And I asked her to compare them. And you could see here, okay, that relatively there's a peak that corresponds between ex experimental and theoretical uh, results. And I asked them to do it with Toluene. So I, I have uh, uh, data from the bench top from your college, okay. And then acetonitrile. So acetonitrile, you have this peak, which is the cyano. Okay. And then since we have forensic science program, we incorporate an experiment where we put a sample that contains the nitro. So this is me mimicking what? The explosive. And we ask the students if there's an explosive, or this is a mock explosive in the sample. And as we go on, we, we use more uh, nitro containing uh, compound. And the students were happy with this training that they have, okay? And then one student was working with uh, Coram Penicol. Uh, he's doing, doing GC uh, MS analysis. So he said he wants to do also Raman. So I asked him, okay, you can do the Raman uh, using your sample, and then you can do the calculation. And all of the cal uh, what we call peaks in both experimental and calculator are usually... Uh, they, 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 behave, uh, they have the same pick in most of the samples that we run. And I also have the calculated one from the uh, bench top thing. And then we use the silenes that we usually use for GCMS and IR. So we already have the handheld uh, RAMA. So I said, why can't we use them? And then when they analyze these uh, uh, samples using the three instrument, I asked them to write some sort of a full report. Okay. And one students want to do an analysis. So the, 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 the thing that we do here is we use a, a common and unique pick, just like what we did with the estrogen. Okay, So we're able to get the same results as the one that we have in estrogen. And then this is the most popular one that we have, the over-the-counter drug. So acetyl salicylic acid, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, naproxen, or guaifenesin. So by reading this, you don't know what they are. But when you're looking what I'm meaning, uh, doing is you, you're familiar with this thing. So what I developed in an instrumental class, we have an unknown where they are going to identify okay, the over-the-counter drugs given to them using the Raman. So I asked them to go over the benchtop results that I get, okay, see if there's unique peak and common peak, and then they run it using the portable one. So this is the portable one. As you see, the signal is not as good as the benchtop one. So we compared the different ibuprofen, we compared the different acetaminophen brand, and I always have a kicker them when I give them Tylenol Red, they thought it's not uh, acetaminophen. So most of the time they got wrong there, okay? And then we have the mucinex. I asked them to look at the white and the green side of the stuff and why the, the red one has this picture. So usually the color that you have there uh, might, uh, contribute some fluorescence in the sample. And then we have this, uh, what we call a lid that we have here, okay? And then right now, what, what, what we're trying to do, so they use Raman to detect counterfeit for Viagra. So this is the original one, and this is the fake one. So look at the fake one. There's some additional takes that you don't see in the original one. And then we also use the Cialis here 
So you could see the counterfeit, okay? They have additional pick, okay, compared to the original one. So I was in the Philippines in 2018 and my pharmacist gave me uh, not enough metformin. So instead of 45 metformin, he gave me 30. So out of the sudden, good thing, I can buy uh, over-the-counter metformin here. So when I come back, I have some samples. I told my students, can you analyze it? So I found out they're okay, except for this one here. Okay. But the rest of the functional group, they seem to be fine. Okay. And, and I think the, the uh, company that, uh, that uh, where the metformin uh, manufacturer is a little, little good one. So I asked my student to analyze that one. And some of students might. So the same thing that I asked them to do. Uh, group assignment and look at the difference. So this is benzoic acid derivatives. Okay, so the one that is changing is the uh, substituent in this uh, ring. And then the, kuma the kumaric acid here or the cinamic acid derivatives that uh, we're almost finalizing uh, hopefully by this semester. And then I have some antibiotics in the lab once students work on it. Okay, so this is the portable one. This is the bench top. And then another student did the sulfa antibiotics. So I asked them, I asked her to compare the five member drink compared with uh, what we call the six member drink. Okay. Now, the future projects that we have, Jason let me some samples, uh, poop turtle coming from a professor in Hofstra. And he asked me to continue to determine the microplastics. And since we're near Chinatown, okay. We try to look at these, uh, what we call counterfeit drugs. Okay, so you know, you know China, right? Yeah, they say if it's uh, not made by God, it's usually made in China, okay? And then I have a student from UP Diliman who did uh, a part of her MS thesis. Uh, he, he brought me some seafoods. So we try to develop uh, using the portable one, uh, put the quantification of quality. So we have here tilapia different process. So we try to see, does this really make sense? Okay, so we might uh, uh, use a, a little bit powerful Raman. So I'm thankful that we have this thing so that I can start doing my uh, proposal to purchase a Raman because this is the uh, UP student who worked with me. Now that black curtain there, okay, there is an old Raman spectrometer that I got from a uh, private company, but unfortunately, Horiba don't want to install it. So I, I might be forced to apply for the NSF MRI grant to purchase a Raman spectrometer, okay? Uh, so that that room can be utilized. So the members who did the Raman here, all of them are ladies. So Claudia Sobolowski did the initial one. Uh, some did the Sol Gel. Uh, Tabitha Bate is a Phil Am, okay? I uh, was doing a PhD now in uh, Northeastern uh, uh, University. Uh, he did the chlorum pentacle. Naja Abbas did the, so, uh, the ionic liquid. Alexis Yabornik was now in forensic science in Texas. He did the uh, sulfa. Uh, Ashley Kapsor, a pill arm also from Philadelphia, is now with NYPD. He did the chlorophenolone. Some did the, uh, some fish again did the phenolics. Jahaira Sapata. Uh, completed the uh, over-the-counter analysis and then over-the-counter drug analysis. Lauren Riley did uh, the silin. Lyric Wyan did the uh, cyano and Elise Krapso did the metformin. But I think everything uh, I owe is to this guy. We call him the big boss here in your college, Dr. Ruel Di De Samero. And I'm happy to recruit Jason Di Bedad to be his PhD student. So Jason is now in Union College uh, here in New York State. And the lab is now headed by uh, Marvin and Bilo. So the lab, uh, we usually have some visitor like uh, Professor Myla Santiago from UST. We have some undergrad students who did some uh, research with Dr. DeSamero lab. So he had also a black curtain during his lab, okay? And then we also have uh, Dr. Frank Heralde from UP Manila. And I think he will be sending some of her, uh, his students to do some research in the near future in the Sumero lab. So we're happy to say that we have a mafia, uh, at least in CUNY chem. So these are the students coming from USD and UPLB. So that's our bossing here. Uh, and then that's me there. And I'm glad that Kay invited uh, me to do this thing because for the last two months, 
I've been giving webinars to prepare our teachers there for the pandemic. Okay, so I think I have already 16. This is the 17th webinar, and I'm thankful for UP, Visayas Department of Chemistry, because they allow me to guest lecture in an instrumental course, and one of the topics that I have there is Raman. Okay. And all of these webinars, some of them, if you still don't know what to do for the pandemic, you can see it in my uh, personal web page. In fact, I have a webinar by 10 o'clock after this in Cebu, uh, Cebu Technological University. So thank you very much. I hope you learned something with uh, what I have done in uh, Raman's spectroscopy. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much much for that, Amra. It was a very interesting presentation and hope that some of our audience would take interest, especially for those who are not yet into this kind of research. Um, okay, so now we're open to questions. So again, for our viewers, you may type in your comments or questions in the chat box. And for those watching on YouTube, feel free to um, just type in the comment section and I will be reading those questions as well. Okay, we have our first question from IC Duai. So, Elmer, that was an interesting story on the amyloid peptides. Did you try looking at the final size of the modified amyloid peptides, peptides with slow aggregation? Are these comparable with the size of the native amyloid peptide aggregates? So this is the story of that amyloid peptide. What I did is just a, a scratch in the surface thing. Okay. So what happened there is when Jason Bedad took over, he used those peptides that didn't aggregate. He mixed it with the, uh, the, 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 the amylin, uh, uh, what we call peptide. And he found out some of those uh, octapeptides, as we call it, were able to inhibit the amyloid formation of the amylin. Okay. So the, the one that I have is, we could say, I just did the, the, the beginning and I said, Jason, bahala ka na dyan. it's up to you. Okay. Uh, what Jason did is he prepared other, uh, what we call peptide, uh, using the NF gales. And sometimes he is stretched. He include the SN NF gales. And we're able to find out, I, I was still part of it, but I don't want to talk about it because I never really, uh, what we call uh participate in that deliberation on what they said. But there are papers of uh, Jason Bedad with Dr. Desamero that describe how they were able to uh, prepare uh, these peptides that was able to inhibit the amyl amyloid formation of amylin. Thank you. Uh, the next one comes from Janet Morata Fuentes. So thank you so much for that interesting talk. Uh, would you be aware if there is a Raman spectro in the Philippines? Is anyone using it? Uh, this is what I, uh, I'm aware of. I think there's one in UP Manila. I just forgot the name. And I don't know if Dr. Erwin Enriquez already purchased the Explora. Because Dr. Erwin Enriquez, who is a contemporary of Dr. Desamero, uh, he visited us here during the 2017 when I delivered a ACS in Washington. And then I found him in Washington and I told him, why don't you go to New York? And I said, oh, we're really going to New York. And then I said, oh, you might know someone there, Dr. Desamero. And they said, yeah, yeah, he's a, a, a contemporary of mine. And they talk. And I think, uh, I'm not sure, I have... Uh, no contact with Dr. Uh, Enriquez except today when I invited him to the seminar. But the last time he emailed to us that he's planning to purchase uh, Explora uh, Raman Spectrometer. But that's the only people that I know. There's a Renishaw uh, Raman in UP Manila. I know it because I, I read the paper in Philippine Journal of Science about Raman uh, Spectrometer. Yeah, maybe just a follow up on that question. So I know that you've very uh, you've been engaged with a lot of uh, Filipinos and a lot of scientists from the Philippines. Um, in those engagements, have you already explored? Uh, have you explored what what collaborations have you done with some of our scientists regarding this uh, Raman spectroscopy? Uh, uh, I'm part of the twenty million. Uh, what do you call this? Picari UP uh, PCHRD grant there. Unfortunately, the head of the grant, Alonso Gabriel, passed away oh, this year. Okay. And yeah, we're yeah. not done yet with the project. 
And uh, unfortunately, Raman is not included there. But what happened, he was able to send one of his uh, master student, the one who worked with me in the lab, but he's doing this uh, seafood thing. So it, it's not Raman related. So what I'm doing with that project, we're working on breast milk. And he asked me to analyze for the heavy metal content and uh, what we call uh, fatty acids. So we're not done yet because right now my lab is shut down. And I have no plan to do any research for the fourth semester because I said one week, uh, uh, one day a week is enough for me to show up because I have some comorbidity that if I get the COVID, I might die. <laughs> so that, 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 that's the thing that uh, right now that we all we do right now is just look at the data that we have and mm -hmm. see if we can come up with some paper. So that's just one of the, we could say, funded project that we have. I also have some a collaboration with a, a friend of mine since I was there in the Philippines who was in Chad and then went back to uh, PNRI, okay? And then I have some friends in the B program, so they, they, they sent me some properly sample. They asked me to analyze it. So some of my students do it, but, but the thing is, the undergrad that we have here is not the same as the undergrad that we have there. Because the undergrad here, not all of them are required to have this thesis, only the honors thesis are the one that is required. So I cannot uh, rely uh, on my undergrad. I can only rely if they're honor students because they need to come up with the product, which is a thesis, before they complete the degree. So that's why uh, what happens is sometimes it's all me who doing the thing. So I ask them, then sometimes I ask another student to validate the results of the other students and they're, they're good. That's the only time I said, okay, let's publish. Okay, so but are you open to accepting any uh, future students? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, usually uh, I have a network already with uh, okay. UST. I, I, I'm not sure if Sir Gardi is there, <laughs> the, the, the chair of the Department of Biochemistry. Okay, that's that's good to know. Okay, and a few questions from Vince Daria. Um, first one is, he noticed that you were able to detect very small shifts, for example, from 1608 to 1605 uh, centimeters. What is the noise level and detection limit of the Raman setups? And the second question is, do you have an overarching scientific question that puts all the pieces of your results into proper context? So the overarching that we have there is, can we develop inhibitors by using fragments of the peptide? Okay. That's the original plan that we have. So can we take some of the fragments, synthesize them, and we mix that fragment with the whole uh, peptide? Can we prevent it from aggregation? Th that's the main art the, of the story that we have. It's just developing inhibitors based on the fragment. Okay. And right now, Marvin, are you there? I know what the other the students that are that, doing it. That is the same story that we had. So we had some fragments, and I think it, the one that they do is an, it's an SAA. Because I, I, as much as possible, I don't want to what we call the venture on the amyloid, the one that they do by this numerical group. Because the one that I do is different also in my lab. But the one that I do is I use the natural product uh, phenolics to see if I can inhibit the amyloid formation. But for them. The, the, when, when, when we started doing that thing, when I was still part of the thing, is we tried to develop inhibitors using fragments okay, of the amylin. So we chose amylin because others, I think, is the alpha beta peptide for the Alzheimer's disease. So they, 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 they use the same concept that we use. I think that's the basis why we, we, we started this, this project. Okay? And for the ship, uh, it's one uh, wave number for the signal to noise. Uh, th there's really a, a story that we have there because usually we have some problem in the structure that we have. Uh, the building is near this LIRR train. So every time, I, I, I make it my SOP that every time we run the instrument, we run this tall wind. And we always record where is the peak of the tall wind. Because I remember, I think after three years, I said, oh, there's a ship. And then when I realized that the Toluene also ship, I just told the summer, oh, don't mind. We, I just need to do it again. Because we said, this is false alarm. 
so we always run this toluin as our standard to see if the instrument is always aligned especially in the big raman it doesn't have a standard like we're the one who have to find where we need to put the line okay and jason was really good on that thing okay that's why when, when i saw that he was able to get a signal that is a thousand or ten thousand times than me i always said can you prepare the big raman for me when i go there because i usually teach there once a week and whenever I go there, while I'm teaching lectures, some of the instruments are running. So I'm taking advantage of the time that I have uh, there. Because I don't have that high-end instrument at Patient University. Okay, I think Giselle is raising her hand. Giselle, would you like to say something? Hi, Giselle. Yeah, but you can't seem to hear you. Giselle, I think your microphone is off. Yeah, we can't we can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, so while we're waiting for Giselle to respond, so let's just go through the next few questions. Um, this one's from Ray Ranola. Um, are you familiar with Raman mapping and what are the uses of it? Uh, uh, Raman mapping, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is if you have the microscope one. So I never use the one uh, on this, uh, what we call the microscope one. So the way that you try to do it is just like when you look at the microscope. So you have a map there, and depending on the concentration or the functional group that you're looking for, you will see like a map that you have there. Uh, and that's the one that I'm trying to apply for this uh, NSF grant for next year, a Raman microscope, which is a little bit lower than the one that I shown, Explora type. That's the one that we're trying to do. So I never use the Raman mapping, unfortunately, in my Raman experience. Okay, thank you for that. So the next one comes from Marianette Vega. There is a home-built Raman system in NIP Condensed Matter Physics Laboratory of Dr. Sumintak, Dr. Estasha, and Dr. Salvador. Are you familiar with that? Uh, unfortunately, no, but uh, uh, Dr. Salvador is familiar if that's Arnold Salvador. Yeah, and if yeah. this is Dr. Elmer Estasha, we're actually having him next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe we can learn more about that next week. Okay, so the next question comes from Ron Pimentel. So he's from Colombia. So he would like to ask, um, do you think it's possible to employ Raman spectroscopy as an inline sensor of concentration for the industry? A sam are sampling times and accuracy suitable? And the second question is, how can the accuracy of Raman spectroscopy be enhanced? Uh... It depends on what sample you want to analyze. So if your sample is not a fluorescence, I think there are already what we call portable uh, Raman, like the one that we use. Uh, the one that I use, they're still much smaller than that one. And depending on what we call, uh, I mean, each of them has their signal to noise ratio. <laughs> and to tell you frankly, Dr. Desamer would always laugh at my portable Raman. I said, I don't believe in that portable Raman of yours. The signal to noise is really low. And you could see it from the <laughs> But I said, I don't have any money, so what can I do? At least I have something to do here. Okay? So it depends on what application that you can do. And there are usually available uh, what we call uh, Raman. Most of the time right now, the Raman uh, spectrometer are already portable. So we're waiting for the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, because they said they're purchasing uh, portable Raman, so they're going to give up the bench top Ramans, and we're hoping that we can get it because usually we get some hands me down instrument from them. All we all, all we know is we have some uh, uh, what we call clinical faculty who's teaching in our MS forensic science. So whenever we said, oh, we have some instruments that we need to dispose, do you want this one? So we we're able to get a lot of GC. Uh, uh, GCFID and GCMS, we're able to get HPLC. So we're hoping that right now, if you have a Raman, we're willing to take the Raman. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so maybe we'll see more developments on the instrument um, in the coming years. Okay, I think, Giselle, are you back? 
Yeah, Giselle, can we try your mic again? Yeah, I sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay, there we go. Sorry, yes, uh, yes, yes. To my cell phone. So, Elmer, congrats. And thanks Thank for you. helping uh, so many. And uh, wow, it's a full audience. And I even see Leslie Diaz of UP Engineering. So wonderful. First is, uh, have uh, we invited Dr. Desimero as a, as a member? Elmer, first question. Uh, uh, this is the thing. I, I know you know Jin Chong, right? They are contemporary of Jin Chong. Wow! <laughs> I always ask the, ask him, "Can you join?" I said, "No, that's not for me. If you want, you can." <laughs> well, now it's, it's different because we're more interactive. You know, wow! It would be great if we could have him uh, join us and he sees our webinars. No, so well, my own uh, uh, interest is in this uh, peptide fragment that uh, you were looking at as a possible inhibitor and we know that uh, what's critical would be the 3d structure of any peptide um, well does it mimic uh, the uh, the native peptide so uh, to what extent would uh, Raman help with you know the, the 3d uh, structure and uh, of course um, well you look you're using it for known um, compounds mostly, so it's analytical, no? Pero, siyempre, our challenge here is to uh, discover new compounds, in my case, from marine sources, and now I'm also looking at plant. And so, um, uh, naturally, we would always want um, spectroscopies that could um, do absolute configuration. And, uh, well, if it's a peptide with amino acids, then you just want to do uh, also DNL. So I have a, we have a master's student who recently defended and um, uh, the, uh, the uh, determination of the D or L is still indirect and it is just uh, based on um, elution from the HPLC. So it's always our, uh, you know, challenge. So even in UP Diliman, we don't have the appropriate um, uh, ODCRD yet. Uh, to measure small quantities of uh, peptides in the, yep. uh, you know, micro or nano uh, quantity. So I, I think uh, I'm trying to ask how it is that you would use Raman because we don't normally use it, eh? Yeah. Okay. Or to help us with drug discovery, okay, and not just, um, um, you know, work on compounds that are already known. In the case of your peptide fragment for diabetes, it's absolute configuration is already known, but you still want to know what the 3D might be, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's my question, Elmer. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mom Giselle. So to tell you frankly, Raman is just one of the tools. So when we do, let's say, the, uh, the amylene study, we use uh, other spectroscopy, okay? Uh, in fact, the, the thing that uh, we, uh, Dr. De Samara was happy to me because every time I'm in the lab, all of his, his instruments are running. Because the ratio that we have in the lab is he had more instruments than people. So whenever I go there, the UBBs is open, the, the spectroplorimeter is open, the Raman spectrometer is open, the CD is also open. Because what I do from one, from one qubit, I just put it to the uh, next instrument and then the next instrument and then the next instrument. So Raman is just one of the two. It's not the, the only tool that we use when we did the study. And each of the tool has its own purpose. And to tell you frankly, uh, I, I, thought, I know Mam Giselle, you know Frank. Frank stayed here at our place for a week asking me to train how to synthesize the peptide in Dr. Desamero lab. And Dr. Desamero, yes, you, uh, you can train him, but you will be the one to train him, not me or any of the uh, PhD students that we have. So Raman is not, we could say, uh, is applicable for something. So the one I think that uh, it can do it is, you are looking at some novel uh, compounds coming from the marine organisms. So the question that I will ask, how do you test them? Is there any changes that happen during this testing? Because Raman can monitor those small changes. So I think that's where uh, a Raman can be used for application. Because for us, we just monitor it. Oh, there is an uh, what we call uh, a beta sheet. And I, I remember in one of the reviewer, 
one of the uh, uh, when we submitted the paper, one of the reviewers said, "Have you used IR?" So that's why we said, "Oh, this guy doesn't know anything about Raman." Because usually, if you have the IR, whatever information the Raman can uh, uh, get can be supplied by the IR. But it's much better if you have both of them to complement one another. So I think that's the reason why Raman is not really a, a popular uh, method. It's more expensive than the IR. IR here, as early as organic chemistry, students can have access to IR. That's just the way I, I, I look at it from this level. Yeah, thank you, uh, Elmer. And uh, Dr. Desameros, uh, lab is open. Yeah, so we are always open. I mean, the way that we do it is uh, we're willing to host students who want, who want to do uh, their PhD. I think Dr. Enriquez promised us to send her, his PhD student, Dr. Erwin Enriquez, and then Dr. Herald said, I think one MD PhD in the MD PhD program will be sent uh, originally this December, but because of the COVID 19, I think there's a little bit of delay. Because what happened, whenever someone applied to him, he will give it back to me, and then he said, Can you get a background check of me? Because my role, I always said, I'm the liaison officer in the group, and sometimes. If the students have problem going here, I'm the one that I ask them, do you have any problem? And usually I always tell them, if you work in Desamero group, you only uh, don't get one recommendation letter, you get two recommendation letter. I'm the one who will give the other recommendation letter as what uh, Dr. Bidad, when she finished, uh, did. So we, we're always open because uh, uh, the thing is, we just hope that the one who will come here will really work because that's uh, the way that we want. Uh, we want people to run some of the instruments. Well, thanks, uh, Elmer. I just wanted to uh, tell you uh, what we are able to do already in UP Diliman. And Frank obviously is not aware that we are uh, synthesizing milligram quantities of uh, peptides. So we have many uh, conopeptides uh, and turipeptides that we have synthesized in the lab of our collaborator, Aaron Villaraza of Institute of Chemistry. Oh, I see. Here, uh, you know, during a Liberty Blue um, uh, peptide synthesizer with uh, with much uh, greater capacity. So, uh, yeah, so we have um, uh, NMRs in uh, UP Diliman, as you know, a 400 and a, a 500, and I think De La Salle has a 600. And mm -hmm. then um, uh, we have mass specs and LC um, uh, mass spec, uh, tandem mass specs. So uh, these are functioning um, by and large in uh, UP Diliman, except that like most of us, they're on lockdown now. Okay, so there's very limited access and activity because of the COVID. So um, I think, um, yeah, we're kind of getting there. Um, I checked our Erwin Enriquez of Ateneo. Yeah, he's a leading guy in Ateneo, but I didn't see any Raman <laughs> instrument oh. yet in the Ateneo <laughs> website. Okay, but yeah, these are good guys to uh, train and people from their labs would would really work very hard in your labs. So thanks a lot, Elmer. Thanks. Welcome, Paul. <laughs> okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Rosa Ther Teresa Albano. Have you explored Raman studies for materials that can be used for biomass or um, as recycled materials? No, unfortunately, no. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Have you encountered any studies on those? No, not yet. Because right not now, okay. all, all of us, even he, uh, his lab, only I think Marvin is the one going to the lab. <laughs> okay. The next one comes from Leslie Diaz. So um, can you explain a bit further on how gases are measured or tested using Raman? And can the Raman be also hyphenated to the thermogravimetric analyzer, such uh, like the FTIR? It is interesting to note that transformations of a molecule can be monitored. Can this be done in situ? In situ, what is the concentration limit of detection? So, uh, with regards to the gas one, so the way that we try to do it is we usually heated the sample so that it uh, it will uh, volatilize the, the, the uh, into gaseous phase. And what we do is we just heat the probe on that thing and sometimes we're able to get it if there's enough sample uh, in, in, in gas. I mean, if there's enough gas sample that we have here. We also do it with IR. 
Now, in terms of hyphenated, I have not heard uh, anything uh, about Raman being hyphenated because I think it has something to do with the nature because you have to hit a laser to it so that the scattering uh, process will happen. And it, with regards to the detection limit, I think it depends. Uh, the more uh, portable it is, the higher the detection limit. So that, that, that's the problem that they have with this uh, detection limit. But what I know is every year there's always an improvement. The mini RAM that I have from BW Tech, it's not available already in the market, okay? So what they have now is the nano ram, and I think Doctor Advincula, Gobit Advincula, has those stuff in his lab, uh, uh, using for polymer study. Okay, so with the advent of, of technology right now, I think every year the company they always email me, oh, we have this new one, but I said I don't have no money for that one by this time. So it's keep on improving. Okay, and the the thing that we have right now is everything to be done remotely. And even my students who are in the uh, drug enforcement uh, agency already, they said uh, they're thankful that we have a portable one because that's the one that they use right now in crime investigation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. And then we have the last question from Dr. Dilip. So in a sample analysis, what are important about the ID, IG value? I'm not familiar with the IDIG value. Yeah, me as well. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's the first time I heard that thing. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so maybe he can get in touch with you if he would want more details about his uh, question. Okay, I think we've exhausted all of the questions. Elmer, do you have any um, final words for our audience? I just like to say hi to my uh, MS advisor, Dr. Uh, Sorinya Imerka, who's attending right now. Uh, one of my BFF in science, Caster Jokaris, who's also, I asked him to attend because I told him, uh, I'm doing something that you might not know. So I know his imagination <laughs> is really what we call rich. And maybe by tonight, we'll be chatting again, and then he will say something about a uh, particular thing. So all I ask you is, uh, I'm uh, willing to help you, if not in my lab, maybe in Dr. Desamero's lab, but the only thing that we have, because we're a little bit disappointed with some of the things that come here. <laughs> I think most of them are this YOLO thing, you only live uh, once, because I always tell them, uh, all the statue here in, the, in New York City will always be there. And I always tell them, in fact, not all places in New York I have visited already. I only visited those places when I have some friends who come here. Okay. My wife and my son is the one who have visited more places than me. So we are willing to, to do this. I'm, I'm open to collaboration, but though I want to finish first the one that we have with Dr. Uh, Alonso Gabriel. Yeah. So I'm not sure if her student is here because uh, I'm pressured to, to, to produce something out of it. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot do with the pandemic. We're limited with uh, time because the rule that we have, if we want to work on the lab, you have to develop a protocol. And as I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to uh, put myself in those uh, situations. Yes. So that's the thing. So we're hoping that when the pandemic uh, is done, uh, we'll be back to what it is uh, during that time. Uh, what about your talk at 10 o'clock? Is it open to everyone? Uh, it's organized by Cebu Technological University. So the way I ask them to do is, uh, you give me an audience and I will do all the talking. So I think I have around most, I, I don't know, because I was a, a speaker in Bibal, in Facebook. So I'm happy that I was able to share what, because I have two semester, no, two sessions, uh, spring semester and summer session, I, I taught full time. And right now it's the third time and it's getting worse in terms of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> We're already two weeks from the semester. And it, we feel like it's two months already. And yes. we have not done face-to-face -face yet. We, we start doing face-to-face -face next week. But we're hoping that everything will be uh, done, but it will not be the same as the old days. So mm -hmm. that's the problem that we have. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll check all of your lectures in your uh, website. But uh, before we go, I'd like to share with everyone, um, so again, a bit promotion. 
Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Elmer, for sharing with us your research on Raman spectroscopy. So next week, so his name actually came up in our <laughs> Q&A. So we'll be having Dr. Elmer Estasio from, um, who is a professor at the National Institute of Physics at the University of the Philippines. So he will talk about the generation of pulse terahertz radiation in semiconductor materials and antenna devices using ultrafast laser excitation theory and application. So we're doing it again on a Friday at 8 o'clock in the morning for those of us here in the Philippines. And if you're interested, please register at bit.ly slash estasio. And again, the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, you can find us on Facebook in our official Facebook page. We also have our website, which is paase.org. And the webinars that we are conducting, we upload them in our Paase webinar channel, channel which you can find at bit.ly slash paase webinars. Okay, so I guess that ends our session for today. Thank you very much, Elmer. And maybe we'll invite you again <laughs> to talk. On Fine, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, everyone. And I hope that uh, you have a good weekend for those of us in the Philippines, for those in the U.S. So good night and um, see you again next week. Bye. Bye.